Um, why exactly does all this matter? So um, it's not immediately clear. No. <laughs> so the typically a function is defined in the global environment so that the values of the free variables, the free variables are just found uh, in the user's workspace. So this is kind of the the right thing to do. It's kind of what most people are expecting. Uh, if there's no if if there's, you can't find a value inside the function itself, you just look in the global environment. So this is the, the idea here is that you can define things like global variables that will be common to a lot of different functions that you might be defining in your workspace. Um, so, but the key difference in R is that you can define functions inside of other functions. Uh, and so, for example, a function can return a function as its return value. So in most functions, they'll return a list or a vector or a matrix or a data frame or something like that. But it is possible for, for, for a function uh, to return another function. And then that, if that's the case, then the, then the function that gets returned, it was defined inside of another function. So it's the environment in which it was defined is not the global environment. It's really the, the it's it's really the insides of this other function. So this is when things get interesting, um, and this is when the scoping rules really have um, an impact on what you can do. So uh, I'm going to define a very simple function here. Um, and often they, uh, these kinds of functions come in the form of what you might think of constructor functions. Uh, so the idea is that the function is constructing another function. So here's what I want to do. I want to create a function that um, that defines another uh, called make.power. And what make.power takes as input is a number n. Okay. So and inside the make.power function, I define another function called pow. And pow is going to take an argument called x. And um, and so what's going to happen is that the pow function is going to take the, the take the argument x and raise it to the power n. Okay, and so make dot power returns the function pow as its return value. And so you see inside the pow function, um, x is a, x is a function argument, so that's not a problem. But n is a free variable because it's not defined inside the pow function. However, n is defined inside the make dot power function, and so since that's the environment in which pow is defined. Uh, it will find the value of n. Pa the pow function will find the value of n inside this it's that other environment. And so what happens is that I can call make dot power and pass it a number like three, and then it will create it will return a function which I'll assign to to be called cube. So and similarly I can pass two to make that power and then create a function that I'll call square. So now when I when I pass cube the number three. Um, what it does is it raises 3 to the third power, so I get 27. If I call square on the number 3, it raises 3 to the second power, uh, so it gives me 9. And so, um, so, so now I've, cons I've got a one function that can, is capable of constructing many different types of functions um, uh, and by raising them to, to, pow to various powers. So how do you know what's in a function's environment? So you can you can look at the function. So excuse me, you can look at the environment in which the function was defined by calling the ls function. So if I call if I call ls on on the environment for cube, you can see that inside the cube function there's there's something there's an there's an object called n. And if I use get on n, uh, you'll see that the value of n is equal to three. So that's how the pow function knows to raise it to the third to the third power. Excuse me. That's how the cube function knows how to knows to raise the argument to the third power because it's already defined in its in its in its in its closure environment. Uh, similarly, the environment for square, you can see it has the exact same objects in it, uh, but now the value of n is equal to two in the square function. So, um, so so I want to make one brief comparison between lexical scoping, which is what R does, and dynamic scoping, which is what maybe some other functions, some other programming languages implement. So here I've got uh, I'm assigning the value of y equal to ten, and then I'm creating a function f, which takes as an argument x, um, and then it assigns there it assigns y equal to two, it squares y, and then adds uh, g of x. So what's g? G is another function. Uh, which takes as argument called x, and it multiplies x times y. So in the f function, y is a free variable, uh, and g is also a free variable. So the g function uh, is not defined inside of f, nor is it a, 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 an argument to f. Uh, and then in the g function, then the variable, the, the symbol y is a free variable. And so the question is, if I call f of three, what gets returned? So with lexical scoping, the value of y in the function g 
is looked up in the environment in which the function was defined, which in this case was the global environment, so that the value of y in the g function is 10. So with dynamic scoping, the value of y is looked up in the environment from which the function was called, uh, sometimes called the, uh, the calling environment. So in the R, the calling environment is known as, the par as what's called the parent frame. Uh, in this case, the calling environment, y was defined to be 2, and so the, y, the value of y would be 2. So uh, calling the function f would produce different answers depending on whether you're using lexical scoping or dynamic scoping. So the one thing that, that, the, that will make lexical scoping and dynamic scoping look the same is that when a function is defined in the global environment and is subsequently called from the global environment, then the defining environment and the calling environment are exactly the same. And so this can sometimes give the appearance of dynamic scoping even when it doesn't exist. So here I've got a function called g. Uh, it takes an, an argument x. It assigns a to be equal to 3. Uh, and then it adds x plus a plus y. So in this case, x is a function, is a formal argument. Um, a is a local variable, so it, it's not a formal argument, but I defined it inside the function, so that's okay. Uh, and then y is a free variable, okay? So if I call g of 2, um, the function g is going to look for the value of y in the, in the global environment. If I haven't yet defined y, then it's, there has to be an error because it doesn't know what value to assign to the symbol of y. So that's what I get in this line here. Now if I define what y is, I say I assign it to be 3, if I call g of 2, then it returns 8 because now it's able to find y in the global environment. So even though it looks like um, the value of y was looked up in the calling environment, uh, it's actually the defining environment because, because g happened to be uh, defined in the global environment. So there are a number of other languages that support lexical scoping. Uh, some examples are things like Scheme, Perl, Python, and Common Lisp. Um, and of course there's a, a well-known computer science theorem which is that all languages eventually converge to Lisp. Uh, and so it's, it's, not a, it's not an obscure type of feature, it's actually very common in a number of other programming languages. So one of the main consequences of lexical scoping uh, in R is that all the objects have to be stored in memory. So if you're working with a programming language that has very small objects, uh, this is generally speaking not a big problem. Um, but uh, because of the nature of the scoping rules and because of the complexity of the different environments and, way, and, and the way that they're all linked together, um, it's difficult to implement this kind of model uh, outside of me physical memory. And so uh, the, so the consequence was that when R was originally designed, everything was stored in memory. Things are getting complicated now because we have very large types of data sets, uh, and being able to read them into R um, is a challenge if everything has to be uh, stored in memory. Um, second, so every function has to carry a pointer to its respect to its defining environment, uh, and that defining environment could literally be anywhere because there could be functions within functions, uh, and then the and if you do, if one function returns another function, um, then there there has to be a pointer to that piece of memory where the defining environment uh, is stored, and so this makes the model a little bit more complex, but um, uh, but but all the more useful. So. The, in S+, which was the original kind of um, implementation of the S language, uh, the free variables were always looked up in the global workspace. So everything could be stored on the disk because the defining environment of all the functions was the same.